Good afternoon, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to the Mile High City. We are here coming to the conclusion of day two of our two days of coverage here at MWISE, and wow, has it been a week. My name's Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be joined by John Furrier all week. We just had Kevin Mandan. Yeah. We've got a lot of VIPs. I mean, the, the defense is a key part of it, the threats, the data, understanding what's Geo going politics. on. This next thing, we're going to get all the data and what's happening. Yes, absolutely. Without further ado, Nick and Kirsty, thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, sorry. It's the end of a very busy week for you, I'm sure, so we appreciate you taking the time. One of the topics that I've been bringing up on the show today, and we've been discussing, is dwell time. You presented on this. Kirsty, can you just give us a little highlight, like you just give me that lovely <laughs> summary of what you presented on so everyone's on the same page? Yeah, of course. So um, dwell time really is the uh, period between the initial intrusion of an environment to the point when it's detected. Um, so my talk uh, at MWISE yesterday was about, um, you know, we the the industry is focused a lot on the it's getting better um, dwell time over the years has consistently gone down but um, like we spoke about in our talk um, earlier yesterday um, there's always this weird spike at between six months and five plus years where um, there's still this like weird little uptick of a significant amount of data in our data set to cause a blip um, and we really wanted to look at that what is causing that um, because it's really great to look at the, yeah, it's getting better, but what are we doing to curtail the long-standing stuff as well? So so what is causing that? Yeah, so tell us. That's, <laughs> that's really great. So what, what we covered in the in the talk was uh, we talked through some history, right? Because um, we really have to paint the picture of, you know, why these long tail dwell time things happen. So we talked about Stuxnet and, you know, kind of the whole uh, life cycle of understanding what that looked like. And that was like a three year time frame where uh, it was in the wild before it was actually detected and understood. Um, then we flashed forward to, you know, a couple of years ago with APT29 and Sunburst. And that was, you know, uh, initially a nine month dwell time period, um, but then after further discoveries and, and investigations, it, it flipped to 15 months, right? Um, and those two are really, you know, kind of targeted and more espionage related. Um, so then we flew it back and took took a, a bigger picture into looking at like malware distribution groups and talking through like um, all of these opportunistic attacks also provide attackers with sometimes very long um, tail access into an environment because one, they're really hard to get rid of once they get into the environment, and two, um, they have gotten really savvy and like uh, started to evade detections in a lot of ways. Um, and then we kind of rounded it out with talking about vulnerabilities, specifically yeah. Log4j. That one we're still seeing in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone across the world is still feeling the ramifications of that one. So um, we, it was really interesting. We got a lot of great questions about like, how do we, how do we think about dwell time in the case of vulnerabilities? Um, and to which I answered, you know, we have to look at, is your time to patch for your internal environment the same and can you match, can you be faster than the time to patch for the vendor that has put out a patch, right? Because if your time to patch is not, you know, in the same window, then perhaps you're going to fall into that long tail dwell time period. So when you're thinking of vulnerabilities, yeah. think about it a little bit that way. So talk about what you guys do on a daily basis, Nick and Kersey, because you guys are analyzing, but you're rolling up the data. Um, what are you looking at? So explain what you guys do, what's your role, Sure. And, so, uh, and what do you guys do on a daily basis? Uh, we're both on the same team. We're on the Mandy Intel's Advanced Practices team. And what we do on our team is provide sort of analytical context and attribution to frontline Intel. So we've got our managed defense team, and our consulting IR, the guys that go out and yep. do incident response. So we're embedded real time with them for their investigations, and it just goes through that whole intelligence life cycle. They're doing discovery, finding some IOCs, like an IP or domain or maybe a hash. Yeah. We take that, do some discovery, and we go, oh, hey, this is Fin7, or yeah. this is Russian actor APT28, something like that give them yeah. indicators like, go take your investigation here, like maybe their, um, their staging directory is this file path, yeah. and then they go take that information, go for find more badness, and then bring it back to us. We yeah. enrich, and just continue that life cycle, feed it out to the rest of the company, so other yeah. teams, like the espionage team, or the fin crime team, or 
that. You know, any of the other various teams across yeah. Mandiant and Google can leverage that information. You guys go and dig a big tunnel, get close to the day, they can find out all that detective work. Yeah. Uh, super valuable. I mean, we heard from Kevin earlier, response times are critical uh, doing that. But also we heard from John when he was on about the espionage pattern, yeah. Yeah. which is get in there and, and hang out. Yep. Don't dwell, but don't move. Right. And then move carefully versus ransomware smash and grab. Yep. Exfiltrate all that data. In some cases, don't even encrypt it. So, yep. kind of two patterns. Yeah. Is the espionage data look different than, say, some of the other criminals or on the dwell time? Can you explain the, how that's all working? Yeah. So it's actually pretty interesting. Um, so the the concept of the talk was really, you know, me and one of the other uh, folks that were uh, part of the M Trends uh, report last year. We were talking about. Uh, how she thought that it was actually like all of the ransomware stuff is at the front end of this, right? And then all of the espionage is at the end. And I was like, well, it kind of depends. <laughs> because sometimes you do have financial actors that are in there for a really long time. So if you think about, uh, you know, financial actors like Fin7 or Fin6, historically their whole gig was about going in and staying in the environment to capture all of this data. So they're in there for a really long time. They don't want to be seen. They don't want to be heard. They don't want to be noticed. Um, but then, you know, obviously in the ransomware space and like cybercrime underground space with extortion and everything, they want to get paid and they want to be as loud as possible so that it's impossible to hide from it, right? Um, so it's, it, the criminal ecosystem is really changing it up. Um, and I think, you know, we've gotten pretty good at the espionage stuff too. So that's, that's. How do you flush them out? Bring back. Flush out. I mean, the yep. bad guys who are dwelling around in there. So one of the gr great things about our team, uh, I've been with Mandy for about 10 years, and we've gone through changes and reorgs, but that mission of frontline intel has been very consistent in the history of the company. So we've got a huge corpus of data that we can answer all kinds of questions to quickly narrow down, like, all right, this is probably maybe this three groups, go there. And that's just that data yeah. that we've built up over the years, which is super powerful. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we know we've got automated processes yeah. to feed that to either the consultants or our SOC analysts to, to narrow down on the threat actors really quick. It's just yeah. it's that data that we've built you up. You guys have done yeah. a great job with, with that. And then ultimately the security posture for the customer becomes the, the number one thing you guys work on. Yeah. What are they, what are they how are they reacting to this? Are they set up for do you guys have to work with them on their side? How does your team engage the customer yeah. to make sure that's a nice smooth consumption experience? Yeah, so I have to I have to hand it to our customer facing folks like the consultants and like our managed defense consultants um, cuz they're the ones handling those conversations. We have our, you know, strategic team going in and talking through all of that, but um, our team really does feed uh, a lot of the indicators, a lot of what those threat groups are attacking to those groups so that they understand, you know, where we can, where we should be focusing a little bit more on or what should be a uh, higher level for risk assessments within the board, uh, within the boardroom yeah. and stuff. Uh, and uh, I think from us looking at the security posture side of it, um, we are really, we are really in, the great, in a great position to say, you know, this is how attackers are constantly getting in across every type of industry, verticals, um, regardless of what their motivation is, right? Um, so perhaps maybe, I don't know, we should be implementing MFA at the beginning of our setup process as opposed to it being a secondary action, right? Um, and our team really powers those conversations um, that the consultants are having with the board. What are some of the, what are some of the attacks um, that you're seeing in, by industry and that how they differ. And so, two, when the patterns change, because when they get identified, they're going to want to, it's like football, they change their offense. The other coach knows what they're going to do. Yeah. So they kind of change their plays. What are they evolving to? Because there's a lot of that going on. We're hearing that here at the show yeah. big time that, hey, people, they're adapting. Yeah. Uh, what's the adaption look like and has that changed by industry? Yeah, so I think um, by industry is a really interesting question. We always get it, um, but uh, I always avoid that because it's like we're looking at it from our viewpoints or I can't talk about it from like the whole industry. Yeah. I don't have full picture, but what we're seeing just generally is like, um, you know, exploits will continue to be a very big thing like Jenny Sterley was talking about yeah. um, in today's keynote. Um, but also, uh, I think phishing has been moving up and down in the M trends um, in, in, uh, initial intrusion vector uh, standings over the years. And I think that that's going to continue. Um, 
credential credential theft. Um, we yeah. see, we have seen this uptick in um, drive-by downloads uh, for info stealers. Um, so uh, you know, cyber hygiene in an organization is going to be incredibly impactful for a secu uh, security program, right? What in the context of understanding our risk, right? Is a user allowed to? Uh, browse random sites, right? Um, are they looking for things that, you know, perhaps maybe should be uh, offered through a self-service portal, like a, um, a VPN, uh, you know, um, uh, endpoint, right? Um, you know, we, we see attackers leverage those types of things all of the time, uh, and those are infected with some info stealer malware that they are now pulling down all of these creds and then using them either to sell off to a public forum, uh, which then attackers are buying access through that, and we see things like um, on 3944 going in and smashing and grabbing and all So what's the update on the, on the multi-factor authentication? Are people trying to bypass that? Is that an aggressive tactic? And what's the status of that? Because <laughs> I do two-factor authentication all the time, and I can't forget what my password is, yeah. and I know people have hacked that. What's the, the pattern yeah, on so bypass? Uh, we've had some pretty interesting cases um, over the years. Um, a lot of times it's either mis uh, misconfigurations of MFA yeah. where uh, or, uh, users... Fatigue. Yeah, uh, or fatigue. Push fatigue. Um, so uh, the misconfiguration would be that any user could enroll a device as long as they had the process to do so. Um, or push fatigue, like Nick was mentioning, um, which is essentially the attackers just spamming um, at two o'clock in the morning for the owner of the device and they're just like they trying just like, to shut it off. Or click OK yeah. and yeah, that's it. Yeah. Or they're doing something called um, SMS phishing. Um, so they will do a fun um, technical thing where they will steal an SMS uh, de device essentially and take over your phone number um, and use your phone number to get into your account. Um, that, that's a more sophisticated way to bypass it, but it is. Well, I mean, a lot a of you have my friends about this happened recently, yeah. right? and it's it's been pretty it's it's pretty it's spooky. Pretty I think it's it's the the beginning of what will happen a lot more yep. in terms of trust. Because now, yeah, I, I I'm curious what other you, you've described. You see a lot of creative chaos in nefarious behavior, for yeah. lack of a better way to put it, and you, and it. Obviously, there's trends, patterns, and some other stuff, but I, I feel like, and tell me if I'm wrong, tell me your opinion on this, but I feel like not just because of AI, but just in general, because there is a lot of attention on cybersecurity right now. There's a much bigger conversation about the geopolitics. I mean, we just saw what happened in Lebanon. There's, a, there's a, Security is top of mind in a way that it's not always right now. And I'm curious to see, do you think this is the stirring more creativity within bad actors to get creative since we're getting smarter and and I mean this global media and dwell time of 10 days is less like you said it is getting better and in, in from that side of the lens of it so is it folks now just doing what they've always done in a slightly different way or are we seeing slightly more recycling I mean I've got a, some property in a very rural part of Virginia and when I have neighbors and they know where, where I, what I do and what I work for, and they're asking me about cyber stuff. So when it gets down to, you know, your neighbors asking about that stuff, you know that it's it's out there. Yeah. It's not just us talking yeah. about it. So yeah. so yeah, these guys are continually improving and innovating to to make that dollar or to get into those you know Fortune 100 companies. So this this like we we see it all uh, from. You know, the espionage stuff to destructive stuff, ransomware, uh, a little bit of insider threat. So, but they're, yeah, constantly trying something new and something, some new technique. Give us a taste of some of the innovation you've seen on their side. If you had to kind of look at that's the op opposite team, so to speak. How would you, what would you see would be like an interesting, like, wow, actually, good. Yeah. I mean, you got to know the enemy. You got to be, yeah. you know. Of course. <laughs> you know yeah. I, I respect that move. We got you, though. Yeah, so so something that recently happened, and this, like, became public uh, recently, uh, was that there were some secondary factors that were uh, popping up on people's screens, essentially walking them through how to uh, open up a run prompt on a Windows system to type in specific commands to give an attacker re-access onto their machine, um, which I thought was pretty clever because, like, my mom is not going to know what that means. Um, she will, however, call me and be like, Christy, something just popped up on my screen. I don't understand what's going on. 
um, which thank you, mom, for listening to me. Um, but um, I thought that was pretty interesting, right? Because uh, a lot of times we have already talked about um, drive-by downloads. We've talked about phishing with uh, malicious links or phishing with malicious attachments, but we haven't really ever seen a attachment in an email that directs the user to do the thing that the threat actor is already trying to do to provide them access, right? Um, and that's a little bit harder to detect with security tools, right? So um, on the defender side, we have to get a little bit more creative too and like understand what we're looking for and how we're looking for it. Because if someone in, let's say, marketing is uh, opening up a run, is opening up a terminal on a Windows system, that's probably not their normal day-to-day -day action. And if there's not a service ticket assigned to that system where an IT person is gonna go and run that, like if there are marketing people that are running things out of a, a run terminal, like, congratulations, that's amazing. <laughs> but generally speaking, that's not happening. Yeah. So also maybe something worth looking at. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so that weirdness that's happening, um, a good SOC analyst will say, hey, that's weird, and let's go look at it. Um, yeah. And that's something that AI will never replace. That's something that um, you know you can't really teach. That that interest in understanding why is that happening, mm -hmm. uh, that's something that will never replace. And that's the reason I think we all have job security. <laughs> hey, I'm with you on the job security front, but I do think you're right because it's context and nuance. That I mean, that this isn't just the same blatant. I'm going to hack into your system and steal your bank yeah. password when you log into you know Bank of America. It's much more sophisticated than that. To your point, which I think is kind of kind of compelling. I really appreciate the enthusiasm that you have, Kirsty, and I'm curious, because there's probably a few things, and Nick, I want to know your answer to this, but I'm just feeding off sure. your energy for a sec. What excites you the most about the cybersecurity landscape right now? Oh, gosh. Um, I like to, I, me and my coworkers like to joke about how we run off of spite, right? Like, um, we, we want to, <laughs> like, we are very, very happy when we catch infrastructure before it gets to the point where it gets to the customer yeah. or gets to someone in our yeah. disability. And we're like, haha, we yeah. got you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we kind of like yeah, it's drive it. off like that. Superheroes in line of defense, love it. That's amazing. Your security mindset, as Kevin Mandy was said. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then, and then also, you know, when we're working with our MD folks, we're, um, we're seeing things right in the beginning of them trying to get access to a system. And once we are like uh, boshing that and we're able to spin up uh, something that we call a campaign or a global event, and we're able to get those um, TTPs or those IOCs out to everyone across the company in Mandiant and in Google, and we're able to find additional um, victims and we can do proactive victim notifications and we hear about those wins, that is just like, that's our bread and butter because we're like, let's go, we got to. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really what, that's what keeps me going. And then also I have a great team. <laughs> well played, well played, well played. What about you, Nick? What gets you most excited right now? I just love how we keep stacking up wins. Um, like, there was just something that happened this last weekend. You may have heard of, like, the IT worker stuff, the DPRK. We had a low profile, or we had a, uh, a tipper, an alert from our internal fusion cells for our DPRK team. They are always sharing stuff back and forth. Our team took that tipper, fed it off to managed defense, and said, hey, hey, go look for this. And they swept for that low, uh, you know, that, that tip and found a report that was uh, like low threshold, low priority. We said, definitely look over here. They dug into that and then unraveled the whole thing. Uh, started a rapid response and totally triaged that and, and mitigated that threat. Collected a bunch of cool data and then we were able to go back to the customer and say, hey, this is what we found. And the customer comes back with like, love it, more of it. We you. just keep racking up those wins, which is. Well, that's the, that's the beautiful thing. You, they're hiding in plain sight. They're in, mo they're in their playbook. They're in motion. Yep. They're in their execution. They're going for it. Right. Yeah. Low, well, hiding in low priority zone there. Well, anyway, something that was interesting with some other mandate guests we had on earlier today, as I said, we see people on their worst day. 
But what you're talking about right there is actually preventing someone's worst day. Yeah. Which is a really nice yeah. and lovely feeling. And it's also really nice, too, because from where we're sitting, we're supporting the consultants that are having that direct communication yeah. with the people who are experiencing their worst day, right, in their professional yeah. career, probably. Um, and when we're able to deliver, like, hey, guys, we have all of this information. Go find all of this stuff. Here's, like, four steps ahead of what you probably have already been thinking about. And even like walking into uh, what we call an inbound, right? We have a customer calling in and say, we have a problem. Um, they come to our team yeah. and they say, They hey, get the bat phone out. Yeah, they're like, it's hey, awesome. do, do we have any yeah. information about any of this? And we're able to tell them, here's X, Y, Z. And sometimes it's part of a global campaign or something. And we're able yeah. to say, hey, here's everything that's going to happen. And we can prep the customer on it yeah. or the potential customer. Yeah. And even if they don't sign up with us, they get that information. Yeah. We, we've got automation built in. Oh, we think that this might be, Unc 3944, hit a button, spits out a playbook. Yeah. The consultants can go into that inbound and be like, look in your exactly. system there, and yeah. it's really yeah. a value add. Yeah. Even if you don't sign with us, here's everything that you have to do. Yeah. The next people that you're talking to, don't say that, come back to us. We won't be. You know, it's, it's also private victory, like you were saying. It's like, yeah. intrinsically, you guys, is, the way your culture is, that's like the wins, yeah. like just beautiful. Yeah, that is beautiful. All right, on the flip side of that, now that I'm curious, because those are two great answers, <laughs> what do you think is the most overhyped thing in cybersecurity right now? Nick, I'll start with you since Kirsty went first last time. Sure. Um, I think maybe the AI stuff is a bit, you know, it's not there yet. I can yeah. definitely see how, like right now, the we look to our SOC teams as like our farm team a little bit. Like, like we get really good people out of there to come to our team at some point, but in in five years, are those are those so entry level sort of sock things? Is that AI delivered? Is like that all automated? Oh yeah. How does that affect how we we get people onto our team? So, I think the AI is just a little bit hyped up, uh, but I think there's some potential there. We're we're working to um, going take like a whole corpus of data. So, you know, for practical reasons, like a spreadsheet of 10,000 lines and say, hey, AI, look at this and tell me what's going on. We've got, we're almost there, but it's it's just, you know, we're still working it. So yeah. I think that's what I, that's where I would land on it. AI's got some potential, but probably not 100% of the way there yet. I think we still got our training wheels. I, I, at, least, pun intended. at least on the tactical stuff that we do, yeah. uh, maybe on some of the reporting and like tying, looking at large data models and tying things together. Some things I think yeah. is a little bit different. I know exactly what you're talking about, that we're on the defensive preventative yeah. stuff versus the, the yeah. observation. What about you, Kirsty? Yeah. Uh, so if any of my coworkers are watching, they already know. Uh, but um, I am so over the hype of threat actors. Like I will be honest, uh, Jen and I, Jenny Surly and I probably have the same viewpoint is like we need to stop celebrating these actors because a lot of times they're doing outlandish yeah, the, things for yeah. the notoriety, right? Literally for uh, that attention. Yeah. yeah. And and I think that, you know, in uh, just like John said, uh, John Holquist said in one of his keynotes, he said, you know, everyone's trying to be an influencer and that's what these attackers are doing. They're trying to be influencers. Um, and we just have to stop giving them attention, right? Why are we making animatronic like figurines of them and selling them? I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of work that goes into understanding who these threat actors are and getting all of the information to understand how they're doing the attacks why they're doing the attacks and um, getting that information over to law enforcement to help do some sanctions or takedowns or whatever. And that work should be celebrated. I just don't know that we should be putting the emphasis on the threat actor. I love that. That's yeah. a great answer. That's, that's a great response. And that, that's exactly the reason journalists cover certain activities and don't around other stuff that is a bit morose, but to not to not elevate and, yeah. and encourage copycat right. behavior, which I think is, is such good call out. All right, I want to conclude this interview on a really personal note since you brought it up. I don't know. <laughs> Would you like to say hi to your mom? You can stare into that camera and say hi to your mom since you brought her mom. <laughs> Nick, is there anyone you'd like to say hi to? Uh, I think my, my family's watching, so hi, girls. Hi, wife. <laughs> I love it. I mean, what are we doing here in cybersecurity if we're not securing our loved ones' right. experiences? So 
Nick, Kirstie, thank you so thank much you for being for here. Really appreciate it. Thanks. John, oh, always, yeah. a always a pleasure. Thank all of you for tuning in, especially my mom. Hi, mom. Love you, Robin. <laughs> and, and all of our Cube team. We're here in Denver, Colorado at MYS. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube, the leading source for cybersecurity news.